uh, in course of the survey and search, uh, we uh, we need to analyze it. We need to extract the data from that sim, and uh, uh, once we get the data extracted out of it, we need to analyze it uh, to uh, to find out if there is any kind of evidence uh, that can lead to any escapement of income or detection of escapement of income of any kind. So SIM forensics is one of the uh, field of forensics. As you already studied, network forensics, hard drive forensics, and SIM forensics, forensics is also part of mobile forensics. And therefore, it is an important uh, field, important area in digital forensic investigation. So welcoming wholeheartedly Mr. Hiron Bose uh, from CDAC, Scientist E from to this institute and uh, to this uh, webinar. Thank you, sir. I Thank you so much for your nice introduction. Sir. Very glad to have you with us, uh, Mr. Bose. And we are spotlighting you so that we can hear you clearly and we can attend to, you to, to this lecture. So thank you so much and please go ahead. It's all yours. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for a nice introduction. Uh, I hope I am audible to everyone. If anybody can uh, just confirm. Uh, a little louder, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, OK, OK, sir, OK. Yeah. OK, so uh, good afternoon all. Uh, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me for this particular talk. So today, uh, as the, uh, the presenter has already told, uh, we are going to have a discussion on uh, a topic that is called as uh, uh, the mobile forensics. OK, I hope uh, you are able to see my screen. So and also I'd like to request the participants in case of any queries or doubts, uh, please uh, interrupt me in between. Uh, and uh, you, you you can ask the queries. Uh, is my screen visible, sir? I'm just sharing a notepad uh, with a heading mobile forensics. Can anybody respond? Yes, it is visible. OK, OK, sir. So uh, I am also just uh, I have also logged in into my mobile also so that I can just see uh, uh, like what I'm actually taking. Uh, but, but I think there is some delays there. OK. I'm well, not sure uh, whether on our side, I think we are getting you quite fine. So OK. It is, it is perfectly all right. We are seeing a screen notepad screen. OK. And now okay. we are seeing yeah. the same forensics. Yeah, OK, OK, great. OK, OK. So let's begin with this uh, today's afternoon session that is called uh, the mobile forensics. OK, but as you know that if you look at a mobile, OK, now many of you may be going for any uh, many um, uh, rates and all. So at the, in that rates, what you get is you get a lot of digital evidences. Okay. So uh, like since uh, yesterday we are talking about lot of uh, uh, digital evidences. Okay. Now in every case nowadays you can see that uh, we are getting lot of digital evidences there. And now uh, we are having one of the most important critical digital evidence nowadays, uh, which uh, the law enforcement agencies are getting is the mobile forensics. OK, now when we come to so today's discussion, we are going to have the mobile forensics. I will demonstrate some tools also uh, how to uh, do, uh, do do this kind of uh, uh, forensic activity and all. So before moving on to the uh, mobile forensics, I just want to I hope you remember the different steps uh, of digital forensics, but out of that different steps, I will just only take two steps. One is called the imaging step. And another is called the analysis step. I hope these two things are clear to you. Like we have talked about the uh, the disk forensics, we have talked about the the uh, the network forensics and all. In all these kind of forensic activity, the two most important steps is the first one is called the imaging step, and the second one is called the analysis step. Say so if we uh, if we just recollect. Uh, if you are going to image, what is in imaging? Now, suppose if you are going to have a hard disk is there, okay, or you may be getting a memory card is there, okay, or you may be getting a USB pen drive is there, okay. These are all storage devices which is going to be there. So, what is the first step which we are going to take is we have to take the image of these digital evidences. 
okay i'm just giving an example say you take a, a digital camera it is also can be considered as a digital uh, evidence uh, you take uh, a small uh, an electronic pen which is there it is also treated as a digital evidence you take a camera which is now connected to the dashboard of the vehicle that is also treated as a digital evidence so how do we actually start the collection process so the first step before that itself there are a lot of steps are there but uh, to me i will say that these are the two important steps when we are going to collect the data from the digital evidence the first step is called the imaging process so what we are going to do is we are going to take the a, take a forensically sound image a forensically sound copy of the digital evidence which we have taken okay i'm going to take a forensic copy of the digital evidence uh, which i have uh, which i have seized it from the working in the okay uh, which i have taken it from the uh, from the crime scene so after once that is done then what we have to do is we are going for the analysis phase okay so we are going to search for the evidence search for the search for the evidence so this is the two important steps which is actually going to be there so in the first step i, I will write it like a take a copy copy of the evidence i am going to get the, get a copy of that particular evidence so whatever forensic activity which we are going to do these are the two the basic steps which we are actually going to follow first is the imaging part and then is the second one is the analysis part now coming to the mobile forensics before we go to the uh, slides and all i just want to uh, brief you uh, what all things are what are the various digital evidence which is available inside this mobile device the first one is the mobile device itself okay the mobile device the mobile device itself okay so inside the mobile device what we have is we may be having some internal memory will be there similarly uh, okay i will just write it down below this so uh, we are going to have the internal memory is there inside the device so most of you may be seeing that we are going to have 60 64 gb uh, ram is uh, internal memory is there or 128 gb ram is there so that varies depending depending upon the make uh, and the vendor it is the size of the internal memory is actually going to vary similarly inside the mobile device i can put some kind of sd cards an external memory can be uh, connected to the mobile device so if you take a mobile device these are the two things which is actually very important and you can see that inside the mobile in itself what we are going to have is we are going to have something that is called as sim is also the subscriber identity mo module the sim card is also a part of the mobile device so these are the nowadays again uh, like the advanced phones is going to have something that is called as e sim so where you cannot the, the, it's called the electronic sim where we don't have that a physical sim is not available to me instead the sim is already embedded inside the mobile device so the latest mobile phones the latest apple iphones and all they are talking about something a concept that is called the e sim concept so these are the three things which we have inside the mobile device now <clears throat> the second part is we are going to have lot of data is going to be there inside the network operator okay so i hope uh, uh, like today you had a session on the call data records so similar to call data record there are uh, like there are tdr is there the tower data records so there are lot of records uh, are available with the network operator so today in our discussion what we are going to do is we'll be looking at how we are going to do the mobile forensics in the internal memory or basically how to do mobile forensics in the mobile device and then we will also look at a portion that is called the sim forensics how to take the data from this particular sim okay so please remember in both these cases there are two fundamental uh, uh, the concept which we are going to follow is nothing but the imaging you take a mobile device what will be the first step you have to take the image of the mobile phone you take the sim card what is the first step you have to take the image of the sim card only after taking uh, only after taking forensically you are going to take that image then only you what you are going to do you are going for the analysis part so please remember in mobile forensics we have to take the first step is we have to take the image of the mobile phone 
uh, and also in the second step we are going to do the analysis of the mobile phone so these are the two fundamental steps which we are going to see in our session today so let's talk about the tools there are a lot of tools are actually available uh, the tool which i am trying to check is we are going to demonstrate is called as mobile check version 4.1 Okay, uh, this is a tool from CDAC uh, Trivandrum. So, the, by using this particular tool, as I already told you, what I can do, I can take the image of the phone as well as I can do the analysis of this particular uh, of that particular image which I have taken. So, please remember, like almost all the tools, whatever tools we are talking about, uh, is going to talk about these two fundamental concepts only. Now, there are a lot of other tools are also there. One such tool is from the from the company that is called as uh, Celebrate. Uh, similarly, there are, uh, uh, say, uh, Dr. Phone is another tool which we can use uh, uh, for doing the mobile forensics. Uh, similarly, Mobile Edit Forensics. Mobile Edit Forensic. This is another tool which we can actually use for doing the mobile forensics. So similarly, as you as you keep on searching, you can see there are a lot of tools are available for doing the mobile forensics and all. So what is these things? These are the tools which we can use uh, for the doing the mobile forensics. So I will be demonstrating a tool that is called the mobile check uh, that is being developed by CDAC. So we will see. We, I will show you how to take the image of the phone. And then we will be looking at how to do the analysis part also. Okay, so this is the agenda for uh, today's session. Okay, so let's uh, move to the slides and see uh, the slides one by one. So the first step, uh, I hope this is clear to everyone. If you have any doubts, please let me know that. I hope this is clear. Okay, so the first uh, portion of the mobile forensics, we are going to talk about the SIM. Okay, so for the SIM part, you can see that uh, uh, we uh, we are going to look at the SIM forensics. So let's look at this. Uh, look at what are the details of this particular SIM forensics and all. So before moving into the uh, uh, to that respective topic, let me show you how a cellular network is going to look like. Okay, we are all using our mobile phones. We are talking to our family, to our friends, and all. So how this particular entire cellular network is actually going to work? Okay. So in this, I'm having I'm just showing a pictorial representation representation of how the mobile device is actually going to work. So what we have ME is called the mobile equipment. This mobile equipment, you can see that if I want to connect to any cellular network, I can connect only if I am having a SIM card. Only if you are going to have a valid legal SIM card, then only I can I'll be able to connect the mobile equipment to the cellular network. So if you look at the diagram, there are two major blocks are there in the cellular network. One is called the base station subsystem and another is called the network subsystem. And uh, inside the base station subsystem, there are some blocks are there. Similarly, if you look at the network subsystem also, there are some blocks are there. So the towers which we actually see on the uh, on the road sides on top of the buildings and all, they are called as the base transceiver station, or else it is called as BTS. BTS is actually called as the base transceiver station. This is the towers which we actually see on the road sides and all. So you can see multiple towers are actually connected to a base station controller BSC. We call it as BSC base station controller. So BTS and BSC are the two major blocks uh, inside the base station subsystem. OK. So from that, the signal is actually going to the another block that is called the network subsystem. Uh, the system is going to the uh, another block that is called the network subsystem. Am I audible? Hello. Yes, you are yeah, audible, oh, sir. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, So uh, the, the, the multiple base station controllers, what is going to happen is we are going to uh, move it. We are going to uh, we are going to give the signal back to the uh, another next block that is called the network subsystem. 
okay where you can see there are some blocks are there the msc it stand for the mobile um, switching center mobile services switching center and inside that you can see there are some blocks are there HLR, HLR stands for Home Location Register. So what is the purpose of Home Location Register? You can see that the moment you are actually going to, uh, is actually going to stay for under one tower for more than 24 hours, what will happen is your details is going to get recorded onto a register that is called a Home Location Register. Similarly, when you are actually traveling, your details are going to get copied onto the another register that is called as visitor location register. So these two blocks is actually going to contain the details of that particular subscriber. And this information is going to get copied onto the network operator. So as you know that, uh, that if you want to get the details from the network operator, uh, a normal person cannot get, like even I cannot get my call data records. If I'm going to give an application to my network operator, even I will not be able to, I will not be provided with my call data records. It has to be, it has to be asked by a person not less than the superintendent of police. Okay, so that is a rank in who who can actually uh, uh, authorize to get a uh, to get uh, to to get uh, the call data records of one particular person. So. So HLR details and VLR details are going to be stored inside the inside a block that is called a network subsystem, which is available with the network side, with the network operator side. Similarly, we are also going to have another block that is called as equipment identity register, EIR, equipment identity register, uh, where the identity of each and every mobile is actually going to be uh, stored inside that. So you can see uh, it is going to like everybody knows that uh, the mobile equipment is going to have is going to have a unique number that is called as the IMEA number. Okay, international mobile uh, equipment identity is there. So nowadays we have uh, uh, mobile phones with uh, two SIM cards and all or three SIM cards. So you can see that each slot is going to have a unique IMEA number. Now suppose if you are going to use that uh, shortcut key star hash zero six hash, you can see that you get the IMEA number. So if you are having, if you are using a dual uh, SIM uh, mobile card, mobile phone, you will be getting two IMEA numbers. You will be getting one each one for the uh, for the individual uh, SIM slot which is used inside the phone. Similarly, the, we are going to have that authentication center. Okay. Now, what is the purpose of the SIM card? The purpose of the SIM card is to provide authentication and security. So please remember that. These, please remember these two terms, authentication and security. So who is actually going to provide the authentication and security? So this block, that AUC block, is going to provide the authentication and security of this particular SIM card. So inside the SIM, please don't think that it, it is a small piece of... Uh, uh, say a, a small piece of uh, a, a card which is there, but the, inside the SIM card, there are a lot of information is going to be stored inside the SIM card. So the entire connection process is actually going to depend upon the SIM card. So, so that is the purpose. So please remember that authentication center, AUC, uh, it is going to provide the authentication as well as it is going to provide the security mechanisms. And on the other side also, please see that there is the, uh, the exact thing, the reverse, uh, the, this, these components are going to be stored in exactly in the reverse order. So that means on the, this side, we are going to have a network subsystem. And after that, you have a base station subsystem. And then you are going to have that mobile equipment. So that is how a connection is going to be established. So, when I'm going to switch on the phone, what happens is it, you can see that when I'm going to switch on the phone, it takes some two to three seconds before you get that, uh, that the, 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 the tower uh, signal in your mobile phone. So what is going to happen during these two to three seconds? So there is some kind of handshaking is going to take place in between this, uh, in, in, during that two to three seconds. So what is the handshaking process? There is some kind of data is going to get transferred from your mobile equipment to the tower and from the tower to the mobile switching center inside which there is a block called as authentication center is there. So inside that we are going to use there, there is some calculations and all some random numbers are going to be generated and these random numbers are actually going to be transmitted back to the mobile equipment. There is some kind of comparison is going to take place and then only if the comparison is going to be success, 
then only you are going to see the tower locations. You are going to get the signal in your mobile phone. So please remember that there is some kind of handshaking signals are going to take place between the mobile phone and the network operator side. So this is a general a generic block diagram or a generic cellular network block diagram, uh, which is going to be used. Uh, see, and if, nowadays people are talking about 4G and 5G is coming up by, maybe by the end of 2021. In some of the few Indian cities also, they will be uh, starting that 5G service. But please remember that in 5G service, the entire diagram is going to get modified. They are going to have an entirely new set of uh, infrastructure uh, in the case of a 5G network. Now coming to the subscriber identity module. So you can see that uh, uh, it's this SIM card, even though I told you that it is a very small piece of uh, uh, a card, you can see that it is going to be called as a small computer. Okay, it's called as a small computer. So you know that in every computer, what all what all things is going to be there. We have a central processing unit. CPU is there, memory is there, and there are some kind of uh, say I/O interface is also going to be there. So and also please remember that there in the SIM card there are three different voltages are going to be supported: five volt, three volt, and one point eight eight volt. And as you know that there are different capacities are going to be there in the SIM card. Uh, it has got both uh, volatile and non-volatile memory and mostly most important thing is it is going to contain a file system okay it is going to contain what it is going to contain a file system so please remember with the help of if, if, if i can hold files or i can store the data only if you are going to have a file system uh, with you without a file system you are unable to store any kind of data say you are you are creating multiple say documents you are creating you are creating a lot of presentations you are create uh, you are having so many pdf files in there is there in your systems so all these files are you are able to store inside the computer or laptop with the help of a file system without a file system you cannot store anything at all so there are different type of file system. I think you are already aware of that FAT32 file system, NTFS file system. Uh, if you come to Linux EXT file system, when we come to Mac operating system, there is something that is called as APFS Apple file system. So there are different type of file systems are there. So SIM card also is going to have a file system. Very small, a hierarchical based file system is going to be there. So this is how the uh, pin diagram of this sim is going to look like. Okay, so I think all of you are familiar with the pin, uh, with the structure of that particular pin. There are some some pins are there, and each pin is going to have some uh, specific roles, duties, and roles are going to be there. So I talked about the file system. So this is how a file system is going to look like. In the coming slides, I will show you what all things I can have it inside the sim card. So please remember that, and also one thing which I just want to point out in this slide is uh, there are different uh, uh, uses are there for the SIM card. Don't think that SIM is only used for the cellular network or for mobile communication. SIM is having a lot of other uses is also there. SIM is used in medical field. SIM is used in the e-commerce field. There are a lot of applications are there for the SIM card. But in our case, I'm just discussing the SIM card for cellular network. So you can see that there are different standards are there. So we are having the uh, the master file. M stands for master file, under which we are having the dedicated file. DF stands for dedicated file. We are having the standard called as GSM, under which we are going to have a lot of elementary files. So inside the SIM card, I told you that I can store the contacts. Inside the SIM card, I can store some SMS messages. So these contacts are SMS messages and a lot of other files are available all these files are going to be stored inside the elementary file ef es stand for elementary file so you can see here this this is a hierarchy which is going to be there inside the sim card this is a hierarchical file system which is going to be there inside the sim card so the master file then we have the dedicated file and then we have the elementary file is going to be there now I told already I told you that SIM is not a small uh, even though the size of the device is very small you can see that there are lots of information is going to be stored inside the SIM card okay there are lots of information is going to be there so I will just explain some of the important uh, 
data that is going to be stored inside the SIM card. We are having one, one number that is called as integrated circuit card identifier. Similarly, IMSI number, International Mobile Subscriber Identity. So these two parameters are going to be stored inside the SIM card. Uh, similarly, we have the mobile country code. Uh, in the case of uh, in, in case of uh, uh, India, you can see that the mobile country code is uh, 404 and 405. Okay, so what is it? This is the mobile country code, NCC code mobile country code this is the mobile country code for india like as i, I as you know that for india that uh, the pstn number is 91 similarly for mobile communication they are going to identify the our country with the help of a number that is called as mobile country code ncc number there are two numbers that are allocated for india that is 404 and 405 similarly we are going to have another uh, number that is called as the MNC number, okay, MNC number, which is called as the mobile network code. So what is that MNC number? For each operator, we are going to allocate an MNC number. Say for example, for Airtel Kerala, we are having an MNC number. For Airtel Tamil Nadu, we are going to have an MNC number. Say for Airtel Haryana, we are going to have another MNC number. So different operators different based on the states they are going to have provide different mnc numbers are going to be provided uh, similarly you can see that there is something that is called as call limit okay acm max so uh, i i don't know whether you have tried it out so how many for how many minutes uh, can you call can you talk in a mobile phone for how many minutes i can uh, i can keep on talking in a mobile phone like is it like uh, for i can talk for uh, for one hour continuously or is it like uh, the call will get disconnected once I reach that uh, one hour limit okay so the thing is you cannot talk continuously okay it's not forever okay so there is some limit is there so once that limit is re reached what happens is uh, the call will get automatically cut so that limit is also going to be stored inside the sim card the call limit okay so similarly uh, another important uh, uh, parameter which is going to be stored inside the sim card is the ciphering key i told you that the sim is used for two purpose one is the authentication purpose and another is for the security the first what is in my authentication purpose i want to authenticate that connection that number with the network operator that is the first step and then what is the second part the security the 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 talk the the call which i am going to make that should be secured enough nobody a third person uh, you should not interfere uh, in between your call okay so that should be secure enough so the authentication part and security is going to be taken care uh, by, uh, by there are some parameters are there one of the parameter is called as the ciphering key so even though there are a lot of other parameters are there, I just explained a few a few uh, of the data that is stored inside the SIM card. So I told you that ICC ID. I told uh, this is one important uh, parameter which is there. Okay, so it's it's a it's a numeric uh, digit which is already stored inside on the back side of the SIM. So any SIM you buy, you can see this uh, numbers get, is printed on the back side of the uh, SIM card. So if you if you look at your sim card all the sim card that is used in the cellular uh, network is going to start with 89 so please see the number i told you that sim is not only really used for mobile communication or cellular network it is also having lot of other applications are there but the mobile sim is going to have a starting digit two digit it is always going to start with 89 so what does that mean it is an industry identifier prefix 89 means it is used for telecommunication purpose and the next two digit is it is going to be the country code okay from which country this is actually going to this particular sim is going to belong and then the remaining digits are actually the issuer identifier number as well as the individual account identification number so, so some so some culprits what they do is they just scratch off this particular uh, printed digit printed numbers from the back side of the same so even if they are going to scratch it off 
uh, this number is already embedded inside the sim so i can actually uh, recollect this data uh, from from inside that particular sim itself so this is another uh, thing which is there inside that international mobile equipment number imei so this is a uh, um, unique number that is uh, stored inside every mobile that is uh, getting manufactured nowadays earlier we used to have some chinese phones which doesn't have these ima numbers and they were connected to our networks also but now the the regulatory commission they try uh, the authority of uh, the the mobile communication they try uh, has now uh, explicitly told that you cannot have you cannot connect a sim card to the network with if it is not having any ima number so nowadays the rules are very strict okay so how do i get the ima number star hash 06 hash okay so this is a shortcut uh, key for getting the for getting that ima number of that particular sim card so as i already told you many in in many of the slides uh, the purpose of the sim card it is used for authentication as well as it is used for security purpose okay so please remember this particular uh, two things which we are going to have so i'm just skipping some of the slides uh, I don't think that is required. So, <clears throat> on the slides, I told you that there are some uh, the, the two the two major things is authentication and security. So, how do we actually achieve it? There are some algorithms are there. These algorithms are embedded inside the SIM card. Okay, what is the name of the algorithm? That is called as A3 algorithm and A8 algorithm. So, please just uh, try to remember the name of these particular algorithms A3 and A8. That is used for authentication. Now, similarly. For data transfer, I'm going to make use of another algor algorithm that is called as A5 algorithm. Okay, so basically the SIM is going to contain some authentic uh, some algorithms. They are called as the A3, A5, and A8. A3 and A8 is used for uh, uh, for authentication, and A5 it is actually used for SIM card. So these are the three algorithms which is going to be there inside the sim card okay as well as please remember that these three algorithms are also available with the network operator side also okay so with the help of these algorithms only these authentication and security is going to be uh, is we are going to achieve the uh, the security as well as the authentication part okay so just note down these algorithms so you can just later refer to google for if you are interested in technically if you are interested you can just refer google and you can get more details regarding this a3 and a8 nowadays you see a lot of crimes are taking place uh, with the manipulation of the sim and one such is called as the sim cloning okay and also please remember that uh, if you want to do some kind uh, any crime of related to the same uh, there is some kind of social engineering attack is also there i hope uh, if you are new to this term that is called a social engineering attack like they uh, the hackers what they do is they just try to manipulate uh, the the mindset of the normal human being okay so they just talk they just make they maybe say for example they make a call uh, to the to a person saying that i am calling from airtel okay uh, we are going to get an offer for you okay so with this re re related to this i am actually going to send an otp number to you so once you receive that otp number sir please switch off the mobile phone for say 10 minutes okay so what this particular person like how uh, the, like the, the 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 opposite side will be talking in such uh, like in honey terms like the 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 actual user is going to get confused whether i am getting a call from the actual uh, 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 the network operator itself so the what this fellow uh, if it is if he if he is not that much familiar with the with the cyber crimes and all so what this fellow is actually going to do is he will just uh, uh, he will agree to that person and he will do whatever things whatever say, things he is saying he will agree to it so in between what happens is within these 10 minutes they are going to get a new sim card and by using this sim card they are going to take uh, the, the, by by that time and I, please see that before getting this particular before calling making a call itself these hackers will be having all the data that is related to that particular victim in victim so they may be having their bank account they may be having 
their uh, password. So all these things are going to be collected by the hackers and then only at the final step only they are going to do some kind of social engine and they want that person to switch off the mobile phone, phone for at least 10 minutes. So within these 10 minutes, what they are going to do is they are going to get a new SIM card and they are going to install all these applications. They are going to draw, withdraw all the money. They are going to do all harm for that particular victim. So in that, so this is just an example, like the the way the hackers are doing it nowadays are really, are really, are very really challenging. Even the law enforcement people are really finding it difficult to cope with this new kind of uh, technology which the hackers are actually going to do. So these are some of the websites which you can refer, uh, which will be used for uh, for SIM cloning and all. Okay, so you can just uh, uh, once the session is over, you can just uh, uh, browse these uh, websites. Now let's come to the tool part. I told you that in the SIM forensics or in any forensics, I told you that there are only two steps are there. What are the two steps? The first step is we are going to take the image of the SIM and the second step we are going to do the analysis part. Okay, so we are talking about SIM. So in the SIM also, we are going to do the same process. We are first, we are going to take the image of the SIM. I want to collect all the data that is associated with that particular inside the scene. And then once that image is captured, you are recorded that particular data of the SIM, then we are going for the analysis part. Okay, so we are going to look at a tool and that tool suit is called the SIM extractor. SIM extractor. So please remember the term, the, the name of the tool. What is the name of the tool? It is called the SIM extractor. It is called a SIM extractor. What it is going to do? It is going to seize. So seize means I already told you there are different term terminologies are going to be used. We can say that it is all, all similar to image. Okay. Seize is analogous to image. Uh, and then we are going to acquire. Okay. These two things to, we are going to combine and we are going to call it as the imaging process. And then what is the second step? So first we are going to do the image and the second we are going to do the analysis part. Okay. So it's a tool, it's a forensic tool used for imaging as well as for analyzing the SIM card. Now, uh, this, as I already told you, this uh, is a tool suit which has been developed by SIDAC Trivandrum. Uh, this tool suit is going to consist of uh, four components. One is called a SIM card reader. I think everybody is familiar with the memory card readers and all. So similar to that, we are having something that is called a SIM card reader. Okay, it's a hardware. It's a it's a hardware tool, and uh, we are having a slot here where we'll be putting in the, uh, the where we are going to put where where we are going to put the uh, SIM card, uh, so that I can actually do the other two process, the imaging part and the analysis part. Okay, so I'm just going to show you uh, the. Uh, I'm just going to show this uh, the, this particular hardware tool. I hope uh, uh, you can actually visualize it. Okay, so you can see it. This is the hardware which is going to be there. Okay, uh, it's a it's a it's just looking like a memory card reader where we are going to plug in that SIM card. Okay, so for taking the image, this particular hardware tool is required. Okay, so with the help of this SIM card reader, you are going to take the image of the SIM. So for taking the image, we are going to use a tool. And for the analysis part also, we are going to use another different tool. And there is one upgrade facility is also there for upgrading the firmware that is available inside the SIM card. Now, um, so just to recollect, I, let me show you, uh, let me tell you that in the SIM, what we are going to use, we are going to use something that is called a SIM imager. It's the name of the tool. What is the purpose of the SIM imager? You are going to take the image of the SIM. And then once you have that uh, image, then what I'm going to do is you're going to do the analysis. Analysis. For that, we are going to have a tool that is called a SIM analyzer. So associated with, and please see that we require a hardware also, and that is called as the SIM extractor. So with the SIM extractor, SIM imager, and SIM analyzer, I can do SIM forensics. You are going to do SIM forensics. So let's look at the first tool that is called a SIM imager. Uh, 
So I please see that for all participants, I have already connected a SIM extractor in my laptop. Okay, and that hardware piece is already plugged into my uh, laptop USB device. So I'm going to run the software that is called the SIM Imager. Okay. So here you can see that you are going to have two tools. One is a SIM an imager and another is called the SIM analyzer. This is used for analysis. This is used for taking the image. Now I will, let's look at the first tool that is called the SIM imager. So I hope uh, uh, like you have been, um, uh, the, we have already covered that cyber check suit and all. Okay, so just similar to that, we are using a tool that is called as the SIM Imager. So I'm just opening that particular SIM Imager tool. So I told you that what is the purpose of the SIM Imager? I already told you it is used for taking the image, taking the image of the SIM card. So as usual, you can see that there, is, that we have to uh, fill up fill up some details like related regarding the uh, the the investigation details and all. Okay, so I'm going to uh, provide some name. Okay. Crime number, I'm going to provide one, two, three. Seize memo number. Place of seizure, I'm going to say Technopark. The name of the suspect, I can give. Address one, address two of the suspect. Name of the witness. Kerala, name of witness two. The notes related to the case. The lab reference number, I'm just giving it to one, I say let's give it as one, two, three again. And then this is another important thing that is the evidence file name. Okay. So I'm going to say uh, Technopark underscore theft. Okay, this is the name of the file which is going to be created. So please see that I'm, we are talking about the SIM imager and we are in step number one out of five. So what we are going to do, what we are going to provide in this step number one, we are going to give all the investigation details. Okay, and also please look at the file name. Why? Because this is a file which we are going to create. All data inside the SIM card is going to be created, is going to be copied onto this particular file tp underscore theft. That is the name of the file which we are actually going to create. So I hope this step one is clear to all of you. I click on the next button. So you know that in any forensic, I told you that we have to take the image in a forensically sound condition. I have to ensure that there is no tampering is going to take place. So how do I ensure that no tampering is going to take place? So we have to see we have to do some kind of hash hashing we have to do hash algorithms we have to specify so that we can ensure that there is no tampering is going to take place on the original evidence so to do that we are going to make use of some hashing algorithms so on the screen you can see there are some default there are some hashing algorithms are already displayed the default hashing algorithm which is there is called a sha2 I hope you already uh, have seen or, or you are already uh, know what is the purpose of hashing and all. So I'm just going to uh, copy that particular. You can take the destination path also here. You can see that uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, store my the file which I'm going to take the image onto this particular directory in my laptop itself e colon anna so i'm just going to uh, go to e i'm going to specify this folder i'm going to select that folder so that imaging image file which is going to be created is going to be copied onto this particular directory and i click on next and also please see that i'm I, i'm in step two of four of the same image software i'm in step two of four two of five so i'm where i have selected the hash algorithms I click on next so you can see it is going to show me all the inputs okay uh, which i have actually typed in the investigator name rank police station crime number uh, the notes okay the evidence file name and also where this particular file is going to be selected 
Okay, so you can see the hash type which I have selected is SHA2. And this is the file which is going to be created. So you can see here in my e partition, in the investigator name, the file number, this is a file. And also please see that file extension, it is called as XXIF. Okay, the file name is dot sxif this is the name of the file which is going to be created sxif so i if everything is correct then what i can do is i agree to it and you can see i am in step three of five in the same in same image of software and the moment you click on this start imaging button can you see here a button i'm going to say that i'm going to say i'm going to use start imaging button start imaging okay start imaging start imaging so the moment you are going to click on this particular button what happens the imaging process is going to take place so whatever data is there whatever file system is there inside the sim card it will be copied onto this file so that later we can actually start doing the analysis process so here you can see that it is taking some time so you are in step four or five so you can see that if you are able to successfully take the image you can see that imaging of sim card is completed successfully click next to proceed okay so you have completed step five four of five i am going to click on next so where i will be reaching in step four of five of five here you can see that i am having different options are there i can open the image folder in which that image has been created or I can print the report which I have generated during the imaging process or I can view the report or I can image another sim say so I am uh, this particular imaging is not proper so I just want to take uh, one more time I just want to repeat it one more time so in that case I can do image another sim or else I can open this analyze image image button which is going to open the sim analyzer software okay when when i'm going to click on this particular uh, button what happens it is going to open the sim analyzer software okay it is not mandatory that you have to click here in other ways also you can go to uh, you can just open it separately also no problem so i just want to uh, i just i'm not using any of this particular button i just i will just show you how to view the report Okay, so can you see the report? This is the report which is going to be create, generated uh, for that imaging. So can you see that hashing, the hash value, and this is the hash, uh, the uh, the 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 hash value of that of this particular image. And also, can you see the ICC ID number which is uh, printed on backside? And also, can you see the different file IDs, the master file, and also can you see the different files? file name say sms it's a file i already told you that sms is a file and this is a corresponding hash value of that particular file similarly if you can come down you can see there are n, n number of files are there which is going to be stored inside the sim card i already told you that even though it is a small uh, card you can see there are a lot of device a lot of information is actually going to be stored inside that particular small piece of a uh, uh, small piece of uh, 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 sim card so this is a sample report which is going to be generated okay you can see the date and time in which this imaging has been processed so all these things are actually going to be done uh, taken in this particular sim card so i'm just going to open uh, click on open you can see that that uh, the file will be open for you okay so you can see here this is the image file which has been created tp underscore theft dot sxif is the name of the file which has been created now let me take this second software that is called as sim analyzer so this completes the first process called as sim imager i hope this is clear to you so we have completed we have taken the image of the sim card now what is the next step i have to do the analysis part i have to do the analysis part so you can see here i have done, i have taken the image by using the sim imager now what is the second what is the second phase i am going for analysis so what is the name of the software sim analyzer is the name of the software which i am going to use for doing the analysis part okay so let me take the sim analyzer software sim analyzer
So the the tool is started. So here you can see that I, I have one button which is saying that load the evidence. So I will click here, and I have to go. You have to go to the location where your information is going to be stored. So my information is stored inside e partition. I have a file that is called as tp underscore theft dot sxif. This is the name of the file which is going to be created. So I am going to select that file and click on open. So once it is open, you can see here this is a sim analyzer tool. I am not doing any kind of uh, physical analysis. Everything is actually done automatically. So you have that information which I already filled up when during that the first step, step number one of imaging. This is the different hash values of the various files. This is the sim info. You can see that ciphering key, IMSA number, ICC ID number. All these numbers are actually embedded within the sim card. You cannot actually read it. Otherwise, you cannot read it. But you have to do the imaging, and then only you can actually read it. The service provider name. Can you see Airtel? Service type. It is GSM. I told you that sim is not only used for communication cellular network, but also it is used for lot of other purpose also. Okay. Now we have the contact. So if any contacts is there, you can see that that contact details will be there. If any SMS message is stored inside that SIM card, you can you can see that it will be displayed. And also, please see that if I am going to delete that SMS from the like suppose assume that you are having an SMS stored in the SIM, and I am going to delete it. But do, take, during that imaging process, you will recover the deleted SMS also, provided it is not overwritten. Similarly, you get the call logs. the location the report also we can view in this particular analysis tool so the sim which i have just now taken the image it doesn't contain any information so i'm just loading a sample image which i am having which is containing some information okay let me take some sample image i'm just taking a, another sample image okay so you can see it is coming So let's look at the contact. Can you see some contact details over here? So these are some of the contact details. You can see how many contact details is there. There are around 208 contact details are there here. Okay, and also like say if I want, I can do some kind of searching also. Say nine double four seven double three, nine double four seven double three. Go. So can you see here? It is going to display that particular. contact details here okay can you see here and this is the evidence in which this particular contact is available so you can search in that in that particular manner also if you want we can actually do that searching operation also so this is a contact which is going to be specified so in the sim you can see that this particular image was containing around 208 contacts similarly if you look at the messages can you see these messages so there are some sms is also stored so this was what i was telling now suppose if you can see uh, can you see that is it deleted is another option is there so in this sim in this particular image these sms are already deleted but you are able to recover it why because nothing has overwritten that particular uh, that particular memory location so you can see that i have actually uh, i was successfully able to recover this deleted message also similarly you can look at the call logs okay this image doesn't have any call logs and you can view the report also you can print it out okay directly you can if a printer is connected we can print this report also so what is this software called it is called as sim analyzer where you are going to load that particular image which i have generated from the first software that is called as sim imager software so please see that there are two softwares are included one is called as sim imager and another is called as the sim analyzer i hope this is clear to you so this is going with this we are going to complete that sim forensics part i hope uh, this is clear if you if you have any questions i i can take that questions now or else uh, we will move to the next topic called as mobile forensics anyone who has any question uh, you are most welcome to ask a question at this time because the topic on sim forensic 
has come to an uh, end. And uh, if there is anything that you would like to ask, any question, it could be as simple as yeah, yeah. Anything. Don't don't yeah. Don't worry about the questions. Whatever okay. doubts you are feeling in your yeah, mind, whatever you doubt, have, whatever yeah. Simple doubt is also there. You, you are you ask. are free to ask. Don't uh, don't feel feel anything at all. I'm here to uh, clear your doubts. कोई भी किसी तरह का डाउट हो कोई भी आपका कोई क्वेश्चन हो कोई एक्सपीरियंस हो हिंदी में भी हिंदी में भी पूछ सकते हैं कोई भी आपका कोई एक्सपीरियंस हो जो आप शेयर करना चाहते हैं या कुछ पूछना चाहते हैं कोई सिंपल चीज भी पूछना चाहते हैं आप पूछ सकते हैं ओके सो Okay, we can move forward yeah, to the next we, topic. Yeah, because, we, we, yeah, uh, yes, sir. We'll be collecting the questions and we'll send the cross to you. Yeah, sure, proposal. sure, sir. Sure, sure. Thank you. So uh, our next topic is the mobile forensics. Okay. So in the mobile forensics, I told you that uh, even though there are three parts are there, we already covered that same part. And also in the external memory, most of the mobile cards are having the support of uh, plugging in that external SD card. You you can actually plug in, but uh, these external sd cards are normal storage devices so what i can do is i can do the imaging part uh, by using a tool that is called as trueback i think it's already covered and then we can analyze it, analyze analyze this particular thing by using something that is called as a cyber check suit okay so um, then it's just like a normal uh, storage device so i can do it with the help of uh, these two softwares i can actually do it okay but coming to the internal memory it is pretty difficult you cannot use a normal tool okay normal disk forensic tool we cannot use so we have to use some specific tool which is used for for doing this mobile forensics so the tool which i am actually going to do is called as mobile check version 4.1 okay so this is the name of the tool i told you that in almost all the forensics what are the two important steps imaging part and the analysis part so here i have connected a physical mobile i have connected a physical mobile here okay i have connected an stc uh, physical mobile itself i am just taking it uh, so the name of the software by which we can actually control your mobile i'm just showing you the home screen here so uh, the name of the tool which i am just using is is called the visor okay uh, one minute okay the name of the tool is called as the visor okay so i'm just showing you the uh, the actual uh, physical mobile here okay so you can see that i'm just switching off the mobile it goes it comes so you can see that there is no pattern or there is no pin lock here you can see i will show you once again so you can see that there is no pin locks okay and uh, this is how the phone is going to look like okay there are some applications are already installed and all so uh, what i am trying to do is i am trying to take the image of this particular physical phone so coming to that imaging part uh, let, let me tell you there are two type of imaging is there okay Uh, there uh, actually we call uh, like in mobile forensics they call it as acquisition part okay acquisition that means it's uh, the uh, the term is similar to imaging only so there are two type of acquisitions are there one is called as the physical acquisition and another is called as the logical acquisition okay logical acquisition so what is the difference between the physical acquisition and the logical acquisition so suppose imagine that in your phone if your internal memory is 64 gb I, this is just an example okay in your phone you are having a 64 gb phone and in physical acquisition what you do is you are going to image the entire 64 gb of the phone okay out of 64 gb this is the maximum memory internal memory which i was having what i am going to do is you are going to take the image of the entire 64 gb so this is called as the physical acquisition part but when i am going to come to the logical acquisition you can see that i may not take the entire file why because as of now say for example i may be using only say 26 gb 
I'm I'm having the phone is having 64 GB capacity, but as of now you are only using from this internal memory you are only using 26 GB. So the rest of the side the the rest of the storage is actually free. I'm not using it. So in the case of so which will be faster you can see that by just looking at this itself you will be able to answer which will be faster the logical acquisition or the logical imaging process is much faster why because out of 64 gb you are just taking only 26 gb but physical acquisition how it is going to take it is going to take the enter the internal memory itself out of 64 gb you are going to enter 64 gb okay but Say, for example, uh, if I want to get the deleted files and all, uh, say you are having WhatsApp chats are there, you may be having some Telegram messages will be there. Uh, some of the WhatsApp, they are going to delete. So please see that in computer, in digital evidence, you can see that if you are, if you are even if you are deleting, the evidence is not getting deleted until and unless it is overwritten. So what I can do is, if I want to recover these deleted messages and all, we have to go for physical acquisition. Dele logical acquisition is not going to give you the deleted files. It is only going to take the image of the files which is already present inside that. So 26 GB is present, it will take it. But in the case of if I want the, the uh, if the scenario suggests that I want to get the uh, deleted information and all, what I have to do is you have to go for physical acquisition. So I hope you are clear with the difference between the physical acquisition and logical acquisition. So all these tools, which I'm just showing it off in the in the screen, all these tools are going to support these two different type of acquisition. Okay, why? Because it's depending upon the severity of the case, depending upon the scenario of the case, we have to decide whether we have to go for logical acquisition or physical acquisition. Okay, so if it is, if I the, the scenario says suggest that okay, I have to get there are some deleted information is there, you have to recover that deleted information. In that case, definitely there are no other questions. You have to go for physical acquisition itself. So most of the tools which is there, it is going to support both the physical acquisition and logical acquisition. So what is going to happen is I will just draw a diagram before we go and use the tool. Say this is my mobile device. Okay, assume that this is my mobile device. This is my mobile phone. Okay, and this is my workstation, the forensic workstation which is going to be there. This is my forensic workstation. Okay, and I am going to connect. So how there should be some form of connection should be there. So I am going to connect uh, this mobile device. To the forensic workstation there should be some connection should be there normally you can see that we are going to use that usb cable okay so in the mobile it's suggested like we have to enable this usb debugging okay like sidak is also doing lot of forensic analysis mobile forensic analysis and all so what we uh, tell to the law enforcement agencies is that you have to now if the phone has to be provided in an unlock condition Okay, like even if the phone is locked, we are able to uh, crack that particular thing and all, but it is going to be time consuming and a lot, it, it may run into days. Okay, so we don't have any guarantee like uh, we will be able to uh, crack the phone also. So most often we are going to suggest to the law enforcement agencies like you have to, there should be no locks, no password, no pattern, nothing should be there. So what we are going to do is we have to enable the USB debugging. There is one option in the mobile phone setting. There is one option is there that is called as USB debugging. Okay, so that should be switched on. That particular thing has to be switched on. Then only we will be able to uh, we will be able to do we will be able to take the logical acquisition and the uh, physical acquisition. Okay. So from where we are able to get the uh, USB debugging from the developer, there is an option is called that is called the developer from there we will be able to get it. Okay. Now, once this is on, it has to be enabled. Okay, so I forgot USB has to be enabled. Okay. It has to be enabled. So once this is done, what happens next is I'm actually going to inject. 
from the mobile from the forensic workstation where my tool is running okay let me draw, uh, write this here what we have is we are having the mobile check or any tool is actually going to be running say let's have mobile check 4.1 is running here so what this tool is going to do is it is actually going to inject it is going to inject a software from the forensic workstation to the mobile device okay we are going to inject and this is called as something that is called as an agent so we are going to transmit an agent from the forensic workstation that tool is going to do that i'm not doing any uh, 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 i'm not doing it uh, manually i'm just starting the tool the phone is connected with this particular usb debugging enabled option and then this tool when i start using this tool what happens is this tool is going to inject an agent onto this mobile so what this tool is going to do is this tool is going to do something that is called as routing so that term is actually going to be used in the case of android phones okay that term is called as routing i'm going to have something that is called as routing the phone okay so in the case of iphone ios the term is actually called as jail breaking jail breaking okay these are the two terms so what is in the routing so you know that a mobile phone you the the user of the phone is just a normal user i may be having samsung phone inside the samsung phone there there are lot of application that has been uh, pushed by samsung or you take iphone there are a lot of application from apple itself but you can see that you will not be able to you don't have the rights to delete the samsung software so you, you don't have the rights to delete that software which is already uh, coming pre-built with that inside that phone you don't have the rights you are just a normal user so what this agent is going to do is it is going to get elevated okay you are going to get elevated from a normal user so let me so by default you can see that i am just a normal user so what this agent is going to do is i am going to get elevated to a super user okay or we can say we are going to get elevated to an admin privileges so that is the purpose of this particular agent software okay that is the purpose of this particular agent software so what this agent is going to do is that agent is going to elevate the normal user to a super user so this process in the case of android phone this is it's called as the routing process and in the case of ios phone you can see that it is called as jailbreaking that means you are as a normal user you are just getting the elevator to a admin privilege you have the complete rights you can do anything you want inside that phone so that is what this agent is actually going to do okay so this is some uh, theoretical background which i am going to uh, i have told you i hope that this is clear to you now let's see the mobile check software as i already told you that there are a lot of uh, tools are there okay and just we are just demonstrating our uh, cdac tool that is called as a mobile uh, uh, mobile check uh, we are also having uh, a lot of other tools are also there uh say let me take one say um, you can just uh, say i already told you that there is something that is called as uh, mobile edit forensic mobile edit so you can see that uh, this is the this is the this is the mobile edit uh, tool okay so here uh, again you can see that it's getting automatically detected i can do imaging i can do physical acquisition i can do uh, logical acquisition all these things i can do with the help of this particular mobile edit forensic also similarly i told you there is another tool that is called as uh, doctor phone this is also a tool you can google you can uh, uh, you can you will be able to try to download that evaluation version also you can try that is called as doctor phone okay so the tool which i am trying to demonstrate is called as the mobile check so i told you that in mobile forensics there are in almost all the forensics you can see there are only two processes one is the imaging process and another is the analysis process 
So first itself, what I have to do is you have to do the imaging part. So in the mobile check, that is what you are seeing on the screen. What you can do is there is one option is there that is called as acquire device. You are going to have a screen that is called as acquire device. So what I can do here. So what I'm going to do here is click here. A new tool is going to come and that is called as the mobile check imager. Okay. So what is the purpose of this imager? If you remember sim imager, I have taken the image as a sim. So what this tool is going to do is, but please see that it's, it's a tool that is integrated in the mobile check itself. So what this tool is going to do is, it is going to take the image of the mobile phone. It's going to take the image of the mobile phone. So I'm moving forward. Click next. So can you see here? There are two options. There are many options are there, but you can see here uh, like uh, there is physical, logical, backup, MTP, GPS, memory card, bootloader. So many options are there. So what I'm trying to do is I'm just trying to use. I told you that there are basically what we do is we do we just create a physical uh, we go for a physical acquisition and logical acquisition i have already explained the difference between the physical acquisition and the logical acquisition so if i want to recover the deleted images it is always recommended to go for physical acquisition part 64 gb uh, this this was just an example which i told you earlier so i'm just going with uh, the logical now uh, so i'm going to select that logical click on logical so uh, you can see here uh, I'm having different operating systems, mobile operating systems. You can see different mobile vendors. You can see actually normal, basically Android is there, Blackberry, Samsung mobile, Windows, Sony Ericsson, Micromax, so Apple. Okay, so these are the different vendors which is there. I'm just selecting the Android. So you can see here what it is saying is, it is I told you that. I explained what is the purpose of an agent and all. So this phone is already connected via the USB cable. And also I told you that we have to enable that USB debugging option also. So once that is completed, what happens is an agent. We are trying to inject an agent. The tool, the mobile check imager tool is trying to inject an agent to the mobile device. And that agent, what that agent is going to do is it is going to elevate the normal user to an to a super user okay so i told you that so that process is actually now taking place can you see here now it is a little bit of time consuming but uh, i hope uh, the, the 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 subject is known to you okay the uh, i have explained it uh, 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 just now okay so please uh, this the, this injection process it is going to be a little bit time consuming so I hope you are able to understand that. This was the diagram which I have shown you here. I was having a forensic workstation which is uh, installed with mobile check. I have connected the mobile by using that USB cable, USB delta cable. And I already, already told you that in the mobile, we have to enable that USB debugging option has to be enabled. So while when we are going to do the actual connection, what happens? An agent is getting injected onto the phone. which And what is the purpose of this agent? He's going to elevate yourself so that I can go for the logical acquisition and uh, the physical acquisition. Okay. So that is what the mobile check imager is actually going to do it for or do it for on behalf of the investigator. I hope this is clear to you. So what I am going to get in the logical acquisition, you get all the details, call log, SMS, MMS, all details you are going to get. And apart from that, you get the logical files also. When I'm going for physical acquisition, please remember, as I already told you, we are going to get the entire internal memory. What, how, regard, whatever may be the size, you are going to get uh, you are going to image the entire the internal memory of that particular phone. Okay, so I I hope this is clear to you. Okay, for uh, for time saving, I'm just uh, disconnecting it. I'm just closing this operation. Okay, so uh, let me load. Once you have that image, now how to do the analysis? So let me show you that. So I'm already having some uh, images is there already with me. 
some sample Android image is already there with me. So I'm just trying to open that particular image. So you can see that I am having some already some predefined uh, already some image which is already taken is there with me. So I'm just loading that particular image and I'm going to click next and I'm trying to show you how the analysis process is going to take place. So once you have that image, you are having that once that imaging process, mobile check imager is executed and you have that image is there with you. Uh, then what I can like you have that image and the, what is the next step? You are going for the analysis phase. So in the analysis phase, you load that particular image. Whatever information is going to be there inside that phone. So you can see here on the left side uh, of the screen, you can see the contact details, the call log, the SMS details, the emails. OK, the various hash values, the Bluetooth information, the Internet history, the whoever was using that particular phone, he may be connected to the Internet. So that details the GPS log, if it is there, anybody, if it is connected, that details the Wi-Fi networks. OK, so we may be connecting to many different Wi-Fi networks. So all these Wi-Fi networks we are actually going to get all the social network uh, details you are going to get. We get that. Uh, say whatsapp also now in this image there is no whatsapp account details so that's why it is showing it as zero so let me show you some uh, say call logs so you just double click on the call logs you can see that you are going to get that details okay the call time the duration okay all these details are actually going to be displayed on here similarly you get the sms uh, uh, let me let me get the contact you can see that contact details is also coming you get the SMS, so that is also going to be displayed. So this is a trial version. That is why it is only showing the first five contacts, first five call logs, first five SMS. Okay, in the full from the full version, you get the entire uh, details uh, in uh, in from the image. Uh, similarly, one GPS log is also there where you get the uh, latitude and longitude of this particular mobile device. Internet history also you get the the first the 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 first five locations inside that internet history so analysis a little bit uh, uh, the tool is going to help you out okay but even though the tools are there the uh, the human mind is also very important okay based upon the scenario of the case we have to do the analysis that is very important okay so uh, this is about the mobile check so uh, is that clear OK, so we have seen we have gone through uh, some of the topics uh, which we have uh, which I was supposed to do. So we have seen the mobile forensics, how to uh, take the image. I told you that there are a lot of tools are there. I have shown you mobile check by which we can actually take the image as well as we are using that the same tool for the doing the analysis also. OK, so for those technical people, uh, I can say that uh, uh, I can actually rec um, recover all these things with the help of some software that is called as ADB also, and that is called as Android Debugger. Okay. Uh, without any commercial tools, also what I can do is I can just uh, uh, get all the uh, files uh, from this particular uh, from the mobile device by using that AD Android Debugger, which is uh, again provided by uh, developer.android.com. You can also search Google. Uh, you can actually download that and you can get uh, these details also in the raw details that is a problem it will not be showing in a uh, in a nice manner like this it will not be showing in a table format like this but you will be able to get it okay so let me check whether i am having some uh, data is there okay so uh, i'm just showing you some sms mms details over here the raw data which is already there Let me show DB. OK, this is a raw database which is stored inside the uh, inside the phone. OK, so please remember that in Android phones, the all the data is actually going to be stored in the form of uh, SQLite. They are using a small lightweight database and it is going to be stored in .db files. OK, the extension of the file will be .db. So what these tools are actually going to do, the tools are actually going and reading these DB files 
trying to rec recover all the information and it is displaying the information in a nice in a, in a logical manner so you take call logs you can see that you have the name call type is there call name is there the phone number is there the time in human readable the duration everything is displayed in a nice manner but i am going to show you a database also the raw data uh, let me show you that Now can you see the raw data here? So this is how the, da the data is going to be stored in actual. Can you see the date? Can you see the date? It, you cannot read it actually. This is called as the Unix Epoch format. So you have the address and if you scroll it down and also can you see the read status and also the type. Some may be outgoing, some may be incoming. Okay, so you can see that two it stands for outgoing SMS, one it stands for incoming SMS, and also can you see the actual body of the SMS? Okay, but you can see this is all raw data. So, what these tools are going to help the forensic investigators is it is going to display the data in a nice real manner. Okay, so you can see it, it is very difficult, and also you can see the like it's not a human readable date format, so you have to use some conversions and you have to convert it. So that is a disadvantage uh, uh, we have in case if you get the raw data. So these things I can we can actually get it by using the um, the the tools actually. Okay. So I hope I have uh, covered this uh, session. Uh, so if you have any queries, uh, please let me know. So I just share my email ID. So I'm my email ID is hiran at cdac. Dot in and also my number is triple nine five double eight two seven five four. So if you have any queries related to this, you can just uh, uh, mail this or this is my WhatsApp number also. You can all even uh, WhatsApp also. You know, whatever whatever queries or doubts you are having. So thank you all. Uh, over to you, sir. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this uh, session, uh, and uh, it was great to uh, listen to you. Um, uh, personally, for me, it was a lot of learning experience. Uh, we'd like to uh, request any of the participants who has any question uh, relating to uh, this topic. And uh, there's anything or otherwise also relating to cyber forensics as such. If anybody has any question, uh, you are most welcome to ask it at this point of time. Before we move on to our uh, last session of today which will be delivered by Mr. Nabil Koya from CDAC. So, if there is any question in your mind, which you want to ask, that data that you take from the data, what will you do or how will you use the assessment order in the assessment order, or how will you take it from the appeal? So, you can ask questions. और वैसे अगर आप कभी भी कोई सवाल आपके मन में हो तो वो ये मिस्टर बोस का जो ईमेल आईडी लिखा है हिरॉन एट द रेट सी डैट और डॉट इन इस पर आप कभी उनको मेल कर सकते हैं और ये जो फोन नंबर है जैसे उन्होंने बताया कि ये उनका व्हाट्सएप नंबर भी है तो आप उनको व्हाट्सएप भी कर सकते हैं कभी भी आपको कोई भी परेशानी महसूस हो मिस्टर मिस बोस यहाँ का जो सीडैक का जो का जो ट्रेनिंग एस्टैब्लिशमेंट है उसको कोऑर्डिनेट भी करते हैं और इसलिए वो बेस्ट स्थिति में होंगे कि आपकी मदद कर सकें जब भी कोई ऑपरेशंस आप कंडक्ट कर रहे हैं उस वक्त तो ऑन बिहाफ तो डीटीआरटीआई आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक थैंक मिस्टर बोस थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच फॉर गिविंग � Okay, uh, so now at this juncture, uh, we move on to uh, the next lecture of this series today. And uh, for that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you all, uh, Mr. Naveel Koya. So Mr. Naveel Koya is currently, is working as a scientist E. He's working as a scientist E uh, at the CDAC. 
at Cyber Security Group of CDAC, and uh, he's leading a team in digital forensics analysis. So as you are aware that uh, digital forensics has mainly three components, which is uh, and analysis is uh, an important uh, component of of uh, cyber forensics. So therefore, uh, Mr. Nabil Koya is leading a team in digital forensic analysis. Once the data is captured, it is uh, uh, acquired, it is seized, and thereafter it has to be analyzed. So the, this group conducts uh, cyber forensic analysis of uh, all those cases which are reported from various courts and investigation agencies also. So number of courts are referring the matters to them. Uh, and this group is analyzing them. So they have a great deal of uh, practical experience in this field. Uh, Mr. Koya has six, more than 16 years of experience in research, in product development and uh, in training and analysis in the area of digital forensics. Uh, he was instrumental in setting up uh, various cyber forensic labs across the country. Uh, he has analyzed and testified in various courts on matters of digital forensics. In fact, we are lacking uh, in India in terms of the number of cyber forensic labs that we are having here. And if you were to compare it with any other European or uh, American uh, state or country, you'll find that uh, in each state there are about 50 labs in America. And compared to that, uh, we all are also uh, bringing up our figure. We are also creating new labs. And therefore, this is a very important requirement. Uh, Mr. Nabil Koya, he is holding uh, an MTech degree in Digital Electronics and Communication. He is a certified CHFI. I believe this is probably a hacking uh, certification. He is a senior member of IEEE and member of the Institute of Engineers of India. So, uh, welcoming Mr. Nabil Koya among us uh, for the next lecture of today. and. Uh, this is the uh, last lecture of today. And of course, we have another day of uh, training coming up uh, in Cyber Forensics tomorrow also. Uh, but this one, uh, this particular this particular lecture is on Cyber Forensics do's and don'ts uh, and uh, forensic reports that we are supposed to prepare. So this is more of a more of a practical and uh, practical tips. And of course, uh, some detail about forensic reports as to how they are to be prepared so that they are acceptable in various courts and, and higher forums. So, um, Mr. Nabil Koya, uh, can you hear me? It's all uh, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the gentle introduction. Am I audible to you, sir? Uh, yes, Mr. Koya, you are audible. Okay. okay. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, <clears throat> I hope. Uh, I'll share my presentation for that. Yes, we can uh, see your presentation. We can see your screen. OK. Yes, we can see your presentation. Good evening, officers and members of this uh, training program. Uh, myself, I'm Nabil, as was introduced by the speaker. Uh, I work with the Cyber Forensics Group of CDAC. So this being the last session, uh, <clears throat> is it audible once again? Yes, you are audible, Mr. Koya, completely oh. audible. So with this being the last session, I will uh, just uh, gaze through what are on a practitioner note, what are the things to be taken care of actually? What is the current scenario in India? And uh, how is the cyber forensics scenario going ahead in India? So this will be basically um, what is digital forensics procedures in board presenting to a court and standard operating procedures. And I hope uh, this training being on a cyber forensics, digital forensics, most of you might be aware what a cyber forensics is all about. Just to brush up your information, uh, cyber crime is any crime that involves a computer and a crime. 
the computer might have been used in the commission of a crime or it may be the target. Now, referring again to cyber crimes, all crimes that exist in the physical world resurface in the world, virtual world as cyber crimes. It was earlier known as computer crimes, but as gadgets started increasing, if you look into the 90s, you can see only desktop computers. Later, you had laptops coming up, notebooks coming up, mobile phones coming up, smartphones coming up, point of sale devices coming up. Now, your entire infrastructure is dependent on computer enabled devices. So, it's how it has changed, uh, IT has changed the ecosystem. Now, so it cannot be so anyhow called as computer crimes. Now, we use the word digital crimes to any digital evidence which has, or electronic crimes, which has a processing unit or a storing device which is capable of conducting some crime. And this is a statistics which is uh, right now from the COVID scenario actually. Now 80% of the Indian population has moved to smartphone because most of the homes were uh, forced to move to a smartphone as their kids had to undergo online education. And more 74% of the Indian population have access to internet right now. So what has happened right recently is you have a bigger attack surface compared to the earlier condition because 80 percent of the indian population has a smartphone that means uh, there is a higher accessibility of conducting a cyber crime than was it used to be in the previous condition now earlier cyber crimes were confined to a desktop fraud that theft vandalism now what happened is a network started growing as an unprecedented rate so if you look, look into your mobile phones the first question you ask uh, you think about is, is there is a net connectivity? Because without the net connectivity, your mobile phone is going to be a dumb terminal. So network is going to be the computer. That is a term which was coined by Sun Microsystems. And now most of the crimes are manifested as network related crimes. So network related crimes in the sense, actually, you store your data on a cloud system. You store your transactions on a cloud system. Even your Gmail is a cloud based system. And most of the data might be residing in some international area where the Indian government doesn't have a legal sanctity. So these are the issues with the network related crimes. And the newer crimes are bank robbery, which was very rampant with the COVID actually. Because if you look into the literacy rate, uh, because if you look into the state of Kerala, we are a state where it is claimed to have a 100% literacy rate. But the digital literacy is not so much actually. Digital literacy is to be, we can call it some 50 to 60%. And again, the financial literacy on a digital world is coming to be 20 to 30%. That's why a bank robbery has been the new mantra for crimes in this COVID area. And there was an attack on the critical infrastructures. If you have seen, the Western grid was attacked recently and a huge amount of data was flowing to some outside the country and what are the informations which were carried outside the country is still being investigated. And there are still fake news attacking institutions of governments. So these are new age crimes actually. So as you all are aware, when a crime, if there is a crime, there should be a legal system to penalize it actually. And India had promulgated the IT Act in the year 2000. So the main intention of the IT Act was not to look into the cybercrime aspects because if you look into the year 2000 you can just think of what was the computer configuration at that point of time it was just a pentium machine you had a satim or a bsnl 28 kbps connectivity you had mouse just introduced at that point of time you didn't have laptops and the desktops were confined to a medium or upper class community only. so it was not a, such a big thing at that point of time. So India, even though that at that point of time, India had promulgated the IT Act, it was India one of the few, fewest countries which have promulgated the law that, at that point of time. So what basically the IT Act mentioned, of 2000 mentioned was, it was to legalize the usage of digital signatures and electronic communications. So that explains it. If I write a mail to one of your officers, as a civilian, I write to you being a government servant, I write to you on an email, a complaint or a petition or whatever be it actually. You are bound to take legal action because electronic communication has been legalized by this form of communication, IT Act. Even now, court summons are being uh, supplied on an electronic communication channel. 
Similar to that, uh, it ratified the usage of digital signal because that time servers were coming up. Server industry was web servers were coming up in this. So we wanted to know whom were we speaking to actually. And uh, in the cybercrime world, there is a terminology which states that you do not know whether you are talking to a man or an animal on the internet. So what digital signature basically does is it tries to ensure that you are talking to a valid person over the internet. And a simple example of data signature, as you might be knowing, is the HTTPS, the browser going green, or a thumbs up signal coming up. These are all examples of data signatures. Okay. So cyber crimes were mentioned, but not to the tune of digital explosion as it happened today. So there were cases which cited inadequacy in the laws, and hence IT Act 2008 was formulated. So these are the penal penalties actually, section 43, 66, 67, 68, and 69, basically deal with offenses and penalties. And as you might be aware, you can just uh, refer to 60, section 66A, which has been quashed by the Supreme Court, stating that it's the intrusion into the privacy of an individual actually. 67 is basically for obscene content against women and children, and 69 is attack on the critical infrastructure. 43 is for defamation and such in, uh, uh, causing thre theft, uh, threat, all those come under section 43. Now, why do we need uh, evidence? Any judiciary works on evidentiary data for analysis and conviction. It has to be proved beyond doubt that the evidence was related to the case. The evidence should also made be tamper proof. So uh, the rules which were ap applicable to the other evidences are still applicable to digital evidence, but in a much rigorous format, actually. So all the crimes which use a digital evidence is comes under the ban of a digital forensics. Because uh, these are things which I have been hearing for the past uh, training sessions, actually. So I'm, that's why I'm rushing up to it, actually. So Lockhart's principle is basically uh, when you do a crime, uh, you leave something at the scene, into the scene, and there will be traces that can be used as a forensic evidence. So that's the same reason why when you just plug in a USB or when you visit a web website, you look into whether he has visited a website or whether a USB was plugged into the device. So those informations which are which could be retrieved, traces of the, which could be retrieved can be used as a forensic evidence in the investigation. The problem with digital evidence is actually it is volatile, fragile, and can be easily tampered. So that is the biggest problem that investigators are facing these days, actually. So they try to destroy it at any point of time. So the moment you switch off your computer, your data is lost. For example, you are conducting a raid on a big showroom. Take, for example, a showroom, a big textile showroom or a airlines type of showrooms, actually, where you find that the the billing desk or the customer care, they don't have a hard disk implanted into the computer, actually. All they have is a thin client machine which they don't have any hard disk. They are directly connecting to the network, to the server. The daily updates are coming from the server, pushed from the server. So once you switch off the machine, the end, end machine or the customer support machine, you are not going to find any data which will be useful to you. So you need to look, finally figure out which is the server corresponding to it. So this has a bigger ramifications actually, because when you try to uh, look into data of this sort, the volatile data has to be captured at the earliest so that you get a hit, hint into the only information which will be uh, supporting your investi further investigations is where is the server located actually. So that will be a entering point to the investigations. The digital evidence, the second point is it's fragile basically. So once it can be, uh, mishandle it, the data can be lost for temper permanently. And in India, there is a big, this is a big, another big issue actually. We don't have a big utility, big network where we could recover damaged devices actually. Still, um, we lack in this area actually. So the culprits are taking advantage of that uh, to the, uh, the, the culprits are taking advantage of this uh, facility which is not available across the country. And it can be easily tampered with. You might have recently heard in uh, the Bhima Korgon case, 
the analysis, which was done by a foreign company, which stated that the malwares were implanted into the machine and the victim didn't do anything of himself. So it was a uh, action of a malware, but we cannot identify who implanted the malware, but the victim didn't do anything. So now it becomes a tough question. In any investigation which comes before the court, the defense counsel is coming up and telling that, no, we didn't do anything actually. It was a malware which, were, which had done the, all the horrific activities. So my client cannot be made accused in it actually. So now the investigation, the forensic science becomes more tough because you need to prove that it was his activity rather than a mal malicious activity, okay? So that's how a new set of formulations are needed for digital evidence management. So these evidences should be admissible in a court, should be authentic in a court, should be reliable, believable, and complete. So these are any uh, properties of any evidence we should, which are submitted before a court. But admissibility, authenticity, reliability, and believable should be much adhering to these digital evidences. Or else what happens is these digital evidences will not be considered as part of the investigation. And finally, the court shall strike off these evidences. That means your valid testimony relating to the case or valid evidence relating to the case has been moved away. Okay? So that's why you need to follow a very strict procedures adhering to the standards, adhering to the law of the land, so that your evidence doesn't become an admissible in a court of law. Because after all the hard work you have done, you had told for two years, three years to come up with a case sheet. Finally, if it, the evidence is not admissible in a court of law, your old work has been in vain, actually. So it's better to follow the procedures, actually, so that your effort are rewarded. So this is a definition actually, you need not know because everybody of my, you know. So the objective is to identify the digital evidence. You need to acquire the digital evidence. You need to authenticate the digital evidence and report the digital evidence. Acquire, uh, I heard Hiran just now mentioning what is acquisition of a digital evidence actually. So authentication is you need to prove that the evidence hasn't been tampered. And finally, you need to report it to the courts. So, what are the objective of a digital forensics? Sorry, my spelling has is misspelled actually. So digital forensics helps you identify the cause of an attack. It also does in restoration of failed services and it does to mitigate further attack. But uh, our perspective will be on the first one actually to identify the cause of an attack. How did this happen? Was there any useful information which relates to the concerned cybercrime? So this is the cardinal rule which you might have studied during this forensics class actually you should never work on the original medium and use the right protection mechanism but you cannot take this as a blanket statement there are variations of this because this was formulated at a time when the hard disk was the major component of any any electronic evidence right now as you saw hiran Bose was discussing on mobile phones you saw that he had inserted an agent into the device for a logical acquisition or a physical acquisition. Now, how does the work on the never work on the suspect device get validated? Now we are following a, some other procedure. And these procedures has to be validated by some international community so you can stand it before the court of law. And you use a right protection mechanism. Use a right protection mechanism. How do you ensure that? Because you are inserting an agent, then you are telling you are using a right protection mechanism. So you try to ensure that you do not write anything into the data or the stored data rather than the supporting data which is used to store the data okay that means you have the operating system which is a supporting system to protect your data actually so your data will be protected as such but you write something to the operating system so that you can have access to the data which is stored within the device so these are the digital forensic steps for your information. First is identification, seizure, and hashing, and both of them are done at the scene of crime. Then later, depending upon the uh, concerned state, and if you are a tax uh, belong to the uh, 
um, taxation departments, uh, you can directly, you need not move to the court actually. What the cases which we receive from DRI customs or income tax GST departments actually, they directly come from the commissioner to our lab actually. So in case if the law wants you to send it to the court and then send to the lab, do that way, or else you can directly send it to the analysis lab. But you need to ensure that at the scene of crime, you do the complete procedure exactly. So what is the procedure you need to do at the scene of crime? You need to ensure that you are not tampering with the evidence. What, what do you mean by not tampering with the evidence? You need to ensure that you are not working on with the evidence for a long period of time. You can do a forensic imaging, you can do a forensic review. But what happens is actually, you confiscate the guy, uh, record his arrest, but after two days also, you seem to be working with the machine actually. So finally, the defense counsel comes to a statement stating that he was confiscated on this particular day, but after two days, his computer shows some data. That means it is a malified intent by the investigating officer. So that's the scope where the investigating officer has to be very particular about how he handles the evidence actually. So, and there is an IT act also states that the officer not below the rank of a circle inspector, which we call in Kerala, the circle inspector or the inspector of police should be there at the premises to identify and confiscate the evidences. So this is the first procedure. And during the procedure, it has been mandated that you do the hashing at the scene of crime. Uh, just for information, I hope you, all of you know, just can one of you to answer whether you know hashing, what is hashing? Can one or two mute, unmute and suggest whether you? Yes, we are aware of hashing. Uh, I think yeah. most of us uh, have gone through the hashing process. OK, OK, that's fine. So thanks for the answer, sir. So uh, you need to do the hashing at the scene of crime, actually. So what is the practical difficulty in the hashing? As uh, during just prior to my uh, lecture, uh, it was mentioned that uh, there are some 50 plus labs in the US or in other four European countries also. So the problem with hashing nowadays is actually, so if you are an income tax officer actually, or you are a direct tax or income direct, indirect tax department, whatever be it actually. So what happens is actually, now the amount of gadgets has increased so much actually. So if you have done a hashing, you might have done a hashing on a 32 GB pen drive or a 8 GB pen drive. An AGB pen drive might have taken 10 minutes with your utility. But it, when it comes to a 1 TB hard disk or a 2 TB hard disk, which is a norm nowadays actually, because any machine you have a 1 TB disk or a 2 TB disk. So it's going to be one and a half hours to two hours actually. And if you have N numbers actually, that means your investigating team has to spend a two nights or two days at the scene of crime hashing all these evidences. So that's going to be a big headache for the investigating team. So in case if you don't have the proper utilities, you don't have the proper uh, equipments, you don't have the power, there's another issue also, you don't have the power backup also because um, the other guy, because you are going to raid a corporate house, what he might have done, he has um, bribed the uh, local electrician so that power supply is not available. So how are you going to do this uh, continuously for 24 hours or 48 hours? That's a big challenge actually. So the if you have the, if you ensure that everything is in time, tuned, you can uh, go ahead with the hashing procedure. Or else what can be done is actually you re identify all these evidences, seal them, pack them as in a normal evidence collection procedure with two witnesses and everything. Finally, you send it to the analysis lab. But you need to ensure that, make a question to the analysis lab stating that. Because in the sealed cover, you might have made the date, the time of seizing. And so you need to ask a question to the, put forward a question to the analysis team stating that, do you find any data after this point of time? So this will validate your credibility in further investigations because the first question the defense counsel comes up statement is that he had implanted something into the evidence. So after uh, 2nd of February or 1st of January, nothing has gone into the machine and shows that uh, the investigator had nothing to do with the evidence. So that's a way you can uh, ensure that your activity doesn't go in vain, actually. So this is the important part in a hashing process. This is a practical scenario where 
unless you have the proper power supply, the proper tools, it's always better to have a normal evidence collection procedure. Okay. Now, once it's uh, done, you take it to the acquisition. Acquisition means you make an exact copy. And it's done basically at the forensics lab. So how do you proceed to the forensics lab? You usually make a statement stating that please extract all the valid information relating to the case. You mentioned the nature of examination also. So the nature of examination, along with the uh, data which is required by you, will be duly analyzed by the analysis team. And they will come up with the reports. And during the analysis procedure, they also need to do an authentication procedure. So if you look into the second step, which is the hashing, scissor and hashing, if you had done a hashing there, the analysis team would recreate the hash values at that point of time. Or else what will happen is actually, if you haven't done the hashing at that point of time, the analysis team will do the hashing and ensure that this is the hash we have taken at this point of time, including the date and time which they have mentioned. So that ensures that hashing has been done. And now during the acquisition process, they take the forensic copy also. So it can be either way. Uh, you do that authentication and make the acquisition or acquisition and authentication because in most of the handheld devices, it goes hand in hand. Okay, so you make the forensic copy and with the forensic copy, you do the analysis. Now, the original is with you. You have the forensic copy. You now work on the forensic copy as per the nature of examination. And according to the nature of examination, you come up with results actually. So as uh, I just saw in the hidden post session, actually, uh, you look into SMS, you look into call logs, and if it's a hard disk, you look into what were the pen drives inserted? Did he have any connection to any cloud network? Did he have any uh, databases stored within the machine? Did he have any applications which were installed? So a lot of information which is pertinent to the case has to be analyzed. And basically, analysis is a time-consuming process. The big difference is actually, now we don't have a sufficient number of analysis labs across the country. I'm just coming to what is analysis lab scenario in the country, but we don't have, take it for granted, we don't have analysis labs across the country. What we have the CFSLs, we have the FSLs actually, and some institutions like the CDAC or the Gujarat FSLs, Gujarat Forensic Science Laboratory. So basically, all the agencies flood up their data flood up their evidences onto, onto these institutions, and they are unable to complete it on time. One is due, due to lack of experience manpower, due to lack of infrastructure, lack of sufficient tools, actually. So it's uh, also a time-consuming process. Analysis is basically a time-consuming process. You can call it a finding a needle in a haystack. So this is, in a nutshell, what the basically analysis do. you need to do in a lab where you have the sufficient tools you do the authentication, you do the forensic copy, then do the analysis actually. And there are certain instances which where you cannot, can't do the forensic imaging. Then you just do a screenshots, then you uh, certify it that, then go ahead with the investigation search. So finally, once you have come up with the analysis, you make a presentation. Presentation will be a report, which you finally submit it before the court. And finally, you have to preserve the evidence also. We need to preserve the evidence for a longer period of time because I understand if it's for the direct tax or the indirect tax, it's the commissioner who is the first uh, appellate authority. Then the second appellate authority is going to be the district court or the high court. Actually. So you need to preserve the case might go on for five to six years. It might go up to 10 years. And you need to have a pro proper preservation cancer so that uh, the evidence is, if it's a re-examination is required at the high court level, then you need to ensure that the evidence works properly. So this is a, a practitioner way of thinking on a digital forensic steps. I hope uh, it's clear to you. So why do we need a standard? And what are the different procedures? Because we have different devices, different procedures. You might have studied for hard disk forensic step. You need to remove the hard disk, then go with the forensic imaging. Uh, you need to write pro protect it. But in the case of mobile phone, you are studying the ultra things, actually. You, you are directly going to plug in an agent into the device. Then you are trying to extract a logical or the 
primary uh, physical memory. In case you won't, won't get a physical memory, you are satisfied with the logical memory, still your data might be residing within it actually. So in that condition, you need to make a screenshot of the WhatsApp chat or the Telegram chat, which might be pivotal in your investigations. So there are different devices and different procedures and new methods are still evolving in this area. So there is a bigger requirement for standards across the globe. So that's why you need to have standards in a digital forensics. So the first standard which has been introduced is the NIST National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is under the uh, United the Government of USA. And this has been appreciated and it's applied by uh, almost all the uh, scientific communities or the forensic practitioners across the globe. So each country doesn't have a separate standardizing procedure. Now, what they do is actually they give uh, utilize the what is the NIST specified standard. Say, so look into the NIST standards, then look look uh, do the procedures. For example, in the NIST standard for hard disk, they might have mentioned about right protection, the forensic imaging, and all that stuff. But uh, the NIST standard for the mobile phone might have mentioned about the logical imaging, the forensic the physical imaging, how to insert an uh, agent, and all that stuff actually. So. If it's a SIM card, what is the procedure? If it's a memory card, what is the procedure? For a SSD hard disk, what is the procedure? For a point of sale device, what is the procedure? For a memory, what is the procedure? So there are a number of standards, actually. You can just refer to these standards if you need it. And they also provide a trusted tool list for digital forensics. But here comes the difference, actually. Here in India, we don't have a trusted tool list. We are still in the process of making a trusted tool list. So there is a, uh, there is a project called the eCode. Uh, where this trusted tool list is coming into existence. So what does this trusted tool list mean actually? So whenever you do an examination, you need to do a analysis using only this trusted tools actually. So the, there is no ambiguity at a later point of time. So if you are doing a analysis of a light, you use a spectrometry or something like that. Similar to that, if you're using a hard disk, there is a, these are the set of tools, you work on this thing. These are a set of tools for mobile phones, if you want this thing. These are the tools for the memory, you work on this thing. So you so it will be easy for the defense counsel and the leader to analyze the cases at further point of time. And there is another standard, which is a working group on digital forensics, uh, which also specifies certain documents actually. There is another standard which has been published by ISO, which is the IS, so IEC 27037, 27042, and 27043. Basically, what is ISO actually? ISO is a, a standard to ensure that the standards are in place actually. So by ensuring that these standards are ensured in place, you ensure that the procedures you have done to conduct the forensics analysis are to the top quality. You are, haven't deviated anything from the quality procedures, quality manuals, which ensures that your results are consistent. You haven't manipulated with the ev evidences. So this ensures that the credibility of the examiner the credibility of the lab if you ensure that you follow these procedures. So ISO, just to, for a glimpse actually, it gives guidance for the following devices, digital storage media, mobile phones, mobile navigation systems. Um, I hope uh, for the uh, direct, angle, direct access also, we are now, nowadays encountering this navigation system, GPS system, because that has been used to siphon off um, and contraband items or transport Ill Ill illegal items across countries, actually. Uh, digital still and video cameras, standard computer with network connections, network, devices, so this is another uh, standard, how methods and process has to be used during investigation. So now uh, when you are testifying before the court, the first question comes to you as, have you followed a pro procedure? Have you followed any standard? So if you're damn sure that your lab or the procedures you have evolved are according to some international standard, that's pretty good actually. There is no one else to question on that point. Actually. So there is another, this also adds on top to 27043, uh, actually, 27043. It defines a common principle and process underlying the investigation of incidents and provides a framework model for all stages of investigation. It's basically for incident response, 
uh, and also it's a you can look at it as a three tier system 27037 mentions what are the standards should be followed 27041 of uh, 42 mentions what are the procedures to be used and 27043 makes a framework on which you work the whole ecosystem works now uh, this is a uh, Another important uh, detail on a forensics examination, which is known as electronic evidence examiner. So in most of the courts, when as, an, uh, fr as a government official, as an investigating officer, you send it across to CRAC. For example, for example take, you send it to the account to CRAC. And the case comes before the court. Now, the first question as an, asked by the defense counsel to the investigator is, why did you send the case to CRAC? Is CRAC an, an entity? which has any legal authority to conduct such examinations. And when CRAC is testified, CRAC is asked, do you have any legal certificate proving that you are a certified electronic examiner? So this is a new addition to the IT Act, which is known as section 79A. And 79A states that only those labs which are certified by the Ministry of Information Technology under certain guidelines are able to conduct electronic evidence examinations. And the procedure has recently started for the past two years, actually it's happening. Now almost nine labs in the country have been certified under this scheme. Uh, recently the certain has been certified. CRAC is also moving ahead with the certification procedure. Most of the state forensic laboratories are uh, getting certified, it were to be certified in 2020, but due to this COVID, pandemic situation, I think uh, most of their applications are pending for the year 2021 and they are in the due process actually. So what happens right now is all the CFSLs, state forensics laboratories, the Army Cyber Lab, uh, the Services Lab, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Gujarat Forensics Lab, certain labs, all such labs are going to be get certified. Now, what does the certification imply? The certification implies that you are following the ISO 27,037, 42, 43 practices, along with it, the best practices of how to do a lab management system. What is a lab management system certificate? It's actually 17025. 17025 is any certificate which you can see when you go for a routine blood check in the lab. They say that it's an NABL accredited lab. That ensures that they are following the due procedures, the repeatability is there, uh, the error rate is very minimal. So all such uh, conditions are included into this certification procedure. So what the lab should do is the lab should adhere to the general uh, la laboratory principles. It should have a standard operating procedure. And the standard operating procedure has to be derived in accordance with the NIST guidelines, SWDG guidelines, 27,037, 42, and 43 guidelines. Also. And it should have a quality manual. Um, just to the previous point, a standard operating procedure means uh, what do you do in case you have a hard disk? How do you receive a case? Do you have a chain of custody form? Do you uh, forensically image uh, with the in investigator in front of you? So these are the procedures which can uh, make no doubt, not doubt. And the quality manual ensures that uh, the repeatability the procedures are in tune actually so that their results are not error prone. So this is the statement which I mentioned earlier. The procedure also requires the lab to be certified under 17025 for testing laboratories. Now the lab should have the sufficient hardware and software infrastructure. The lab should maintain a record of all activity. The lab should maintain a chain of custody. Now, what is a chain of custody? I hope you know. Basically, this chain of custody starts at the point the investigator goes to the scene, he confiscates a device. Now he makes a note that this device was confiscated from this point of time by from this particular fellow at, the, at this particular location. Now that has been written. So it is received from somebody, it is taken from somebody, and then it has been received by someone. Now, when it comes to the forensics lab, the forensics analyst at the lab writes that it has been taken from the investigator and it has been received by the forensic science laboratory. That means the way the evidence has moved is very important because that can come as a questionable point in a later point of time before the courts. 
because in foreign countries they usually follow the chain of custody and it's very mandatory that the evident moment of your evidence has to be properly recorded so that you do not lose track of your evidence at any point of time and during the lab operations you need to maintain record when did you start the operations for a particular hard disk when was it completed and what were the major findings actually because uh, a normal hard disk analysis might take a uh, 2 to 3 weeks actually depending upon the questions which have been posted so if the question is uh, very silly uh, just to extract the data that will be a, a simple issue but if you are requested to find out deeper insights into the hard disk it might take time actually so it might take 2 to 3 weeks to complete the procedure even with the best automated tools right now available so that means what happens is actually uh, by at the end of the third week or the second week you are unable to recollect what you have found at the first week so you need to have a proper recording mechanism where you look into what were the findings actually during the course of the investigation and the principle of do not work on the original evidence might not be applicable in all cases but this is a typical example which i have recently encountered in our lab actually uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, this uh, drug trafficking is a huge menace nowadays actually so a transporter community a transporter transportation of contraband items is happening so the only device which is confiscated from these uh, device uh, these uh, transportation devices are the gps devices and these gps devices might not have uh, storage there is a no, no proper mechanisms to decode the data so the only procedure is to switch on the machine see the way routes through which he has passed that's the only procedure actually so the principles of do not work on the original evidence might not be applicable in all cases so now you need to justify why you were doing it by switching it on looking into the waypoints and finally coming up to the conclusions and finally you need to make a reports actually the reports has to be signed by the authorized personnel with proper countersigns and seals and if you look into the certificate examiner of uh, electronic examiner they haven't specified any certification for the examiner actually but being a government servant the government has a procedure actually so uh, what it mandates is those organizations the forensics laboratories they are already a competent person who has been recruited by the government so that's why specific certifications are not required in case of a forensic examiner in our country actually and the report should also mention the equipments used the report shall have information on the chain of custody the hashing information any deviation from the normal procedure has to be explicitly stated uh, as uh, hiran bos was mentioning uh, you have two methods actually you have the logical you have the physical mechanism but there is still a, another challenge before the mobile phones you have a pin lock you have a fingerprint lock and also suppose the guy has committed suicide on seeing the investigator or out of fear he has committed suicide now you have a pin lock uh, face recognition pattern lock phone now how are you going to analyze it and this fellow is going to be the only information from which you can proceed further in the case so the next step will be you need to decode the phone decode the phone how do you decode the phone you need to remove the integrated circuits within the mobile phone that means you are going to disassemble it we are now going to construct some electronic parts from those device just as you do a forensic imaging of a memory card you need to identify which is the memory storage then you need to remove it forensically using a uh, sophisticated mechanisms actually and then you need to decode the contents of the memory so this is a deviation from the normal procedure because that uh, analysis is very pivotal to under to go ahead with the investigation so such deviations has to be specifically mentioned in the report section and now what happens in the courts nowadays actually even if the defense counsel because being an advocate he might not be having a thorough knowledge but what he can do is he can bring in experts to make counter arguments to what you have been written in your reports and the 
as you had seen actually the last part is actually you need to preserve it properly and you need to preserve it properly for a longer period if you look into the uh, municipal courts the courts the cases are pending for more than 10 years actually that means your normal mp3 cd player will not work for more than 3 years actually which you run in your car or which you keep at your home so how are you going to preserve such an evidence for a longer period of time so you need to use an anesthetic wax you need to reduce the emi interference so your preservation room has to be very adequate and the best preservation room is the one with a complete glass cabinets and which is very costly so what we do at cdac is actually we do the anesthetic uh, covering then we have a 24 by 7 air conditioned room which is a dust free uh, fire resistant room in the fire resistant sense we have been constructed fire resistant cupboards what we have done is the building material which has been used to con construct the cupboard uh, the walls are fire resistant then we have fire uh, suppression systems and uh, we keep it in uh, enclosed within a cupboards actually and uh, we try to ensure that steel iron alamedas are reduced so that the emi interferences such issues doesn't happen to these evidence section so uh, this is a uh, seems to be a minute affair but preservation for a longer period is going to be a big challenge that's why in the coming upcoming e courts uh, project they are trying to build up a set of servers where these digital evidences are stored in a digital format rather than on your individual hard disk these are already stored in the court premises in a, some servers bigger servers actually so that any of at any point of time the municipal court the district court or the high court or the supreme court can just view it from the repository rather than storing it individually actually so that requires a good bandwidth good network connectivity and a good storage also so that project is still ongoing actually and there are standard operating procedures but uh, still a unified operating procedure has to be devised but the procedures which has been adopted are should be best suited for the indian conditions and uh, i hope uh, most of the officers are from dtrti and uh, the your headquarters has a good training academy has a i think they have made the procedures in a three volumes i once uh, while i was in their campus i have seen it actually uh, three volumes of their this, the operating procedures for cyber digital forensic activities they have beautifully made made it um, come up with this procedures actually now uh new these are the challenges actually you have new devices new devices uh, how we are going to forensically image it then enterprise based forensics just now uh, recently last week we had an attack on the western power grid how are you going to under, understand it big corporates how are you going to do it actually you can't uh, if the data is stored in the cloud actually the cloud is the real estate of the cloud is in uh, united states of america romania or any country which doesn't have a legal implication or you don't have uh, uh, the law which states that what you call there's a law um, which cba basically uses to get information okay if that country doesn't apply to such laws actually uh, how are you going to get those evidences and finding a procedure admissible for the court actually so new devices storage capacity is increasing increase security now all foreign suppliers doesn't do well actually some does well in some product areas the others do better in some other areas and the new gen forensic devices new latest version of the devices might have some more features actually but you might have done your examination on a tool which was 2 years older so does that testify before the court actually because the newer version states that you can you are able to extract telegram chats the early version were was not able to do it so how are you going to justify it before the court actually that's a big challenge actually and the authentication was the hash values done properly okay so oh uh, this is going to be a challenge because md5 is slowly vanishing from the uh, security domain now sha1 and sha2 has replaced it because there is there has been reports where 
challenges are raised on this hash values of MD5. So these are the analysis issues, malware analysis, the analysis of Linux systems, analysis of database files, physical analysis. All those are coming up big challenges. The biggest challenges are damaged devices. And again, audio, video, and image forensics actually. How do you testify? Because audio, video, and image, audio, basically audio segments are not taken as a first level evidence in most of the courts. It's a secondary evidence. Only. Because we don't have a full sort mechanism which can prove that the audio belongs to a particular guy. Because that can be only challenge. And the challenge cannot be mitigated by any of the existing rules in the country also. So that's still uh, another big problem actually because you make a confession of some fellow. Now, how are you going to justify the confession? Unless you have it writing, it's going to be a very difficult procedure. These are some of the conferences just for information. So gadgets are increasing and so is digital forensics. Uh, a lot of research has to go into tackle these problems and the standards are yet to be it's an evolving phase, it's not yet to be evolved, it's an evolving phase, still going to be mature actually. So the only uh, and antidote for this forensics is keep on upgrading your technical forensic skills because every day you have to encounter a new evidence actually. So with that, I end the session. I'll be happy to have questions from you. I hope uh, I was a little bit fast, moving fast in a one hour span. So over to you. For any questions. If participants have any question, they can ask. Anyone? Uh, okay. Uh, can somebody unmute and tell boss is. Was it uh, worth enough to hear the session actually? <laughs> oh. Were you able to follow the procedures? Anyone wants to say something? If you have any queries also, you can just uh, post in a mail to um, Mr. Hiran Bose, or you can uh, contact me. I'll try to help you out. OK, sir. So is what it, it was very informative session on behalf of DTRT Lucknow. I would like to thank you for such a wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all participants. Have thank you so much, sir. Can I disconnect from the meeting? Yes, sir. Participants are requested to join us back tomorrow at 11 a.m.